we're going to start here in chapter 4 and hopefully finish up with the brief discussion of functional decomposition versus object-oriented design principles. So as we've explained, there's no input and output and must input and output in C++ and must be brought in with the IO stream library. We've gone over the extraction operator and the fact that it skips over white space. We've looked at other ways of inputting information using the get command as well as the ignore member function and how it's used to skip over information. We looked at examples of string input and output and our exercise in class beginning our lab last week was one that reversed a last name and we used the get line function to get a string that had embedded spaces in it realizing that the extraction operator would not read our data properly. So all of you have these slides available to you and so the syntax for these various input methods, get line, get, extraction operator, are all available to you as well as examples of their use. So as you write code today in lab, you should have no problem referring back to these slides. We all should understand what a prompt is. We use a prompt to get our user to understand the kind of information that we were requesting from them. Prompts usually begin with something like an enter instruction to the user and generally are followed directly by a CN or a other input instruction for the user to respond to. Oh, I should remind you that many of you have had confusion between the two operators. Let's identify them by name. This less than, less than is called the what? Be careful. Insertion operator. Why is it called the insertion operator? What's the origin of that term, insertion? What does it insert? Well, it has something to do with the output stream. What does it insert? Yeah, essentially, yes, that's what I want. But I want you to use the term that I'm going to use on the exam. So I want to get you familiar with these concepts. What does it insert? And where does it insert it? Does it insert this string somewhere? And insert it to the what? Output stream. Output stream. Okay. It inserts it in the output stream. The output stream that it inserts it into is C out. And what is C out reference? Someone's talked about it. What is it? The, the console window. It inserts it into the console window. So that sort of showing the direction of the insert into here. That's how I remember the direction. It inserts something into that object, into the window. What's the name of that operator? Extraction. extraction operator. Why is it called the extraction operator? What is the context of that term? It's, it, not exactly. It ex yes, sir. It extracts it from, and what's C in reference? It, insert, it, it extracts it from the keyboard and puts it into that variable, extraction <coughs> operator. You need to, need to understand this concept because I will be asking you questions on the exam using these same terms. Okay? 
So, is this an expression? Yes or no? Is that an expression? All of them. Well, let's examine that question. What do expressions have to have? What expressions in mathematics, what are they comprised of? Well, most of them have equal signs in it, but that's not necessarily the only thing or the requirement for an expression. What does expression have to have in it? Yes, sir. Operators and operands. Thank you. Are there any operators in these statements? What are the operators? And the correct. And are these expressions? They are expressions, by the way. Yes, they are expressions. Are they evaluated? Yes. Do they return a value? Yes. Come on, computer science. It's Monday morning. I know it's going to be tough. But we got to get your CPUs operating. So these are expressions. They get evaluated. What's the rule called that dictates how operators of equal precedence are evaluated? Yes. Select to right, but there's a word on the end of that. Associativity, yes. Okay. Let me suggest, for many of you, I see you just focusing on your screens and I am and getting your email. This is probably the time you really want to pay attention. I'm kind of going over the exam for you, okay? So if you understand what's going on here, you have a real good chance of passing the exam. <coughs> let, me, let me just get your focus and your attention. So, as I promised, file I.O. Okay? You can have multiple input files, and you can have multiple output files. There's no limitation. Each file must have a distinct variable associated with it. It's called a file object, but for the time being we'll call it a variable because it functions like a variable. And those types, types specifically meaning I stream no, I F stream and O F stream. These types are defined in the library F stream. So when you're using files, you've got to include F stream. Yes. Right. Opening the file for input is required as well as opening the file for output. And here we have a <coughs> input file called on our C drive, on our thumb drive, or on a desktop is called myfile.dat. It's given, given a variable name and by the same token a out file can be as well. And I think I usually do this stuff off the fly as far as the labs are concerned, but I think what I'm going to try to do in the lab is have you do a <coughs> exercise with both input and output files. And we'll see, get you practice on how to do that. Yes, sir. Um, I tried to compile like this last assignment with two weeks and it was showing like you the new rule or something like that. When you define a file, you first have to go to project add new item and you select on text file, it would automatically give that file a .txt. When you save it to your project, you'll see it as a .txt. So if you need for it to be called dat, you must force it at that point in time to be called dat. The name in your program must correspond to the name of your project. I don't know if that's your problem, but try and make sure it corresponds. I think that's a but it doesn't matter. Right? But but it's dat or .txt. As long as it agrees. It agrees. So some rules about 
how to do this, just basically always open and close your files. You can use the various identifiers for your I.O. statements. Extraction operators, insertion operators, manipulators, get and ignore. By the way, what are the manipulators that we found useful? Can anybody give me an example of a manipulator? Yes, sir. No, those are operators. Those are arithmetic operators. One is the decrement and one is the increment operator. Yes, right next to you. Set precision. What does set precision do? Can you tell me? Right, or three or one or whatever it is. It sets the precision of your output. Yes. I couldn't hear you, sir. Fix. Yes. And show point. It's a coupling one. It allows you to put decimal places when you're outputting float or double value. Yes, sir. Set width. What does set width do? Nah, not exactly. It does exactly what it says. It sets the output window. So if it's one digit is fits here with spacing of two digits, and it sets the width of the output stream space. That's where. Yeah, output stream space. It sets the width. <coughs> it's useful for trying to produce columns, right justified, left justified reports. Where do these manipulators come from? IO manip library. Right, so it must be included. So here's an example. Example I hope you'll use as we move into lab today. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details of the slide, but what I would like to do. It's always a good idea to test whether or not your opening of your file has been successful or not. You'll all encounter situations where it appears that your input data is not read properly. It's always a good idea. If the output file exists, you can test it, and I'll show you an example in my slides, but let me put an example here. Let's say that we have a input object called n file. And we open it, and its name on the file is, you know, uh, my file dot txt. Once we've opened it, we've set a value for that variable. I'll sometimes call it an object, sometimes I'll call it a variable. It functions very much like both. So I can test in file. I can say if, I know it's a little ahead of you in our book, but it's always a good idea to start doing it. If in file, we can see our file open. Words. In other words, if this is true, that means that open operation has been successful. And it's always a good idea to put this kind of thing in your in your program because you just want to test and make sure that, that file is open properly. Now let's let's talk about opening a file in general. I'm not going to go through the slide because you can read that. Opening a file is like opening a book. It's like opening a book at the very first page. When you have read and consume the first page and turn to the next page, your marker is now at the beginning of your second page. So the very next time you come back to that book, in our case that file, to be read, it'll start right there where you left off with a file marker and read the second page and so forth, the third and the fourth. So each time you successfully read, it moves this marker forward in your input stream and when it returns back to read some more data, that marker will be the beginning of that read and it will move forward. Sometimes, 
verse, sometimes inadvertently, you may read past the end of the file. And if you do try to do that, you'll get what's called a runtime error. Runtime errors are very difficult to debug, unlike the <coughs> syntax errors that are checked by your compiler, meaning uses of terms, spelling, and so forth, uses of punctuation, and so forth. The logic errors are ones that are very difficult to debug. So, as I said, when the file is finished, like the in file is finished read, the state of that stream will enter into a fail state. It does not automatically halt at the end of the file. It will continue to try to read past the end of that file. And you must, as a programmer, keep that from happening. And I'll show you some more. Goes into a fail state. And the fail state is indicated by that object having a value of zero. Yes. <coughs> How does it know if it's open? Oh, I'm sorry. It's evaluating the value of it. The value of it. And if the value is a one, that means true. It's been open successfully. If the value is zero, it's in what's called the fail state, and its value is appropriately false or zero. Uh, yes? How do you? You can do it in an if statement. That's a condition. If you could do it like this, also. You could do it like that. Equal equal is, you know, a comparison. So if that's equal to one, then it's open. You could also do it this way. If it's equal to true. Or you can do it the way that I just began by just evaluating it. Yes, when I teach Bible is there's a bracket using like a curse. Bible is a file. These are parentheses. Yeah. Is that what you're asking about? Yeah. This is a condition. We won't study that until chapter 5, after the exam. But I want you to understand that this exists. Okay? So don't get too mixed up. You know, don't get too uh, involved in how did that condition get formed. But that's a condition. Like if that condition is true, then do this. That's the branch. Oh, um, you know, Andy, you can have a candy camera while you go and figure out one of the exams. That would probably be a very good question for us to answer today. Okay? Do you need to go to my office to do it? <coughs> so there are many possible reasons, not many, but several, possible reasons why a file can enter a fail state. One, it's got invalid input data. It doesn't exist. The name doesn't match or it doesn't exist at all. And if you're trying to open something that's been write protected, that's probably unlikely. Okay. But also, it enters a fail state when you've read to the end. So here we have an example of a um, nice runtime entry of a file name. So it's asking, enter your file name, and it enters the file name and then it attempts to open that file. And it converts that string, file name, into a C string, and that's something that you can look at, look up in your index, how that works. But it has to be converted with that member function, C underscore SDR, into a C string in order for the open effect. Okay. So, functional decomposition. We we functionally decompose a lot of things in our mind. This is sort of a very natural, innate thing that we do as humans. We just break problems down into smaller problems and 
typically we sort of gravitate toward the easier problems first. Anybody give me an example of how we functionally decompose things? Yes. That's very good, yes. <laughs> she said planning a party. Okay. What about some other things that we functionally decompose? What about going um, home to your dorm room and beginning your homework? We functionally decompose it? I think we do. We have, it doesn't matter which one we do first, second, or third, right? So it's not a sequential process, but we take the whole process of getting our homework done and we say, okay, let me see what I can do while I'm watching TV and let me see what I got to do to start to focus and process things more attention. But we functionally decompose problems all the time. And this happens in industry, it happens in engineering, where we take a problem and we can functionally decompose it so that several people can work on the larger problem, each one having a functional portion of the problem. Why is that uh, a nice approach to solving a problem? Great, great chess question. Tell me why functional decomposition is a valuable approach to solving a problem. Yes? Well, you're saying faster. It can be, work can be done faster. Why can it be done faster? No, 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 no. I'm breaking it up into problems, segments. So if it, errors are not eliminated or, or reduced. It's just breaking up a big thing into smaller pieces. Yes. That's one thing because you've got a smaller portion for which the error could be found. Correct. What other What's a major reason why doing this? Why do we do this in industry? Yes. Like uh, divide the whole complex code. Yeah, I'm more thinking of not, you're thinking coding and programming. I'm thinking more of just engineering and, and developing things in general. So we allow teams to work on specified areas. That's a good reason. Someone with this expertise or a group with certain expertise can work on the problem that requires that expertise. Another group can work on something that requires a different expertise. Is it a faster way of developing something? Yes. Isn't that sort of the major reason I can get two groups working simultaneously? If I had to plan that party, it would take me longer to do the job. But if I had five friends, each working independent and simultaneously, it can get done a lot faster. Mm -hmm. So the major advantage is that you can divide it into smaller subtasks. And sometimes the bigger problem is a lot easier to conceive of when you break it down into smaller, more solvable components. Also, you can have different people work geographically. Um, I won't do this. Say some more about this. But functional decomposition, we work from the abstract and just major steps and solution. Each of those steps may be having an algorithmic set of steps that can translate directly into code. So we are going to continually functionally decompose our problems as we do assignments, as we do quizzes, as we do labs, as we do exams. You're going to be asked to take a look at a problem and come up with its components. Let's get, let's get a good example of that. One that might strike home because we'll probably do this this semester. Let's say we're developing an adding machine, not a calculator. Let's say we're going to develop a calculator that is appearing in Windows right now that you can look at. Big problem, right? Where would you begin? I don't know. But tell me this. Could you functionally decompose it for me? Give you an example of functional decomposition. What's a very natural way to functionally decompose a calculator? Yes, sir. By mathematical function. Okay. So we might have a function that that adds a function that and a function that divides and so forth. All right. Very good. Another functional portion of a calculator. 
Okay, so we could functionally decompose it so that we have one function that deals with input and output. Okay? What about, so I guess we're talking about an interface. Writes the interface that appears on the screen and then develops the code that allows you to enter information into that interface, question buttons, and a function, perhaps even part of that function, that allows you to get the output back to the screen when you're calculating. Okay, I use this as an example or just scratch it. Um, because we hopefully last year our first exam will develop a uh, calculator, the one that we see in Windows we develop it ourselves. Um, so these functional components are a set of actions, algorithms for those actions, and tasks and algorithms. The units represent algorithms. Data plays a secondary role in this. Now, there is another way, a more, I guess, contemporary way of looking at engineering a solution, and that is an object-oriented approach. Okay, well, here's our structure chart. We've seen things like this before. An object-oriented approach. Remember we've been talking about the CN and C ob all these objects? Well, in computer science, too, which I'm hoping many of you will go on to, which is, as I hear, is going on right next door, Dr. Washington is teaching. We'll talk about and focus on a object-oriented way of looking at problem solutions, where here we may have a self-contained set of entities, or objects, of which we can operate on. And as I mentioned, CN and COUT are those kinds of objects that can be operated on by the insertion operator and the, I'm sorry, the extraction operator and the insertion operator, and various functions come along with those objects, generally called member functions. Now, there are languages that are object-oriented languages. C++, actually the plus plus added, the C language came out first, and then the plus plus was added when the object oriented features were added to C. So the language that we use can use objects obviously. Java, Smalltalk, and others are entirely object oriented, and most modern languages, most if not, uh, I know a few are not, but most modern languages are entirely object oriented. They can still be reused to write functionally decomposed code, and functional decomposition is a integral part of object-oriented design, but object-oriented design is sort of the modern way of looking at things. And you can think about this in this regard. Think about developing a system for Howard's registration process. And I'm pretty sure that Howard's banner registration system is written in an object-oriented fashion. There are entities or objects within that Problem domain. Try not to too complicated. What might be some objects in the problem domain of registration? An object is a abstract entity, entity or thing. I guess I can't come up with a better word. Our chapter, our author does a very good job of describing this in chapter four. Please read it. An object is an abstract entity. Let me give you an example to answer my own question here. A student might be an entity within a registration system. A course might be an entity within a registration system. Now, each of these things, a course and a student, have certain attributes or descriptors. Your ID is a descriptor of you as an object as a student. And a student can have certain operations applied to it. A student can withdraw from a course. A student can enroll in a course. A student can get a grade. A student can um, <coughs> pay their health fees. A student can pay their lab fees. These are natural operations that we think of in our mind. And so the origin of object-oriented design is the way in which we think. 
So it's a very natural, as functional decomposition is, it's also a very natural way in which we think of it. As we look at each other in this room, in our minds, we have a concept of a student, a class of objects called students. And as we look around, we see each other, and each of us has certain attributes. And as things occur in this room, in the course of the lecture, in the course of the lab, certain methods or functions are applied to each one of you. Some of you may raise your hand and answer a question. Some of you may, as a group, leave at the end because your lab's not until Wednesday. So as things happen or occur in the problem domain of this classroom, certain abstract things that we call objects are being operated upon. There are other objects in this domain of this class, too. There's me, and I belong to the class of professor. And there's my TA. There's objects or computers, each of them having certain attributes and being operated upon, turned off, turned on, connected to the internet, and so forth and so on. So again, as we look at this functional decomposition and the object oriented design, we'll find that it is very natural the way in which we look at things and approach our world to solve problems. So in contrast, object oriented design focuses on objects and operations on those objects all bundled together. Whereas the focus of the functional decomposition was actions and algorithms. The focus of object-oriented design are entities and objects. And here, the, one of the leading differences is that data plays a more <coughs> important role in the object-oriented design approach. So just a, a slide so that you're picking We have several related decomposed functions in our problem design, our solution design. Here we have distinct objects that have operations on them. Okay. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Um, we're not going to be writing any object-oriented programs here, but I do want you to understand the concept of object-oriented design. We're going to be writing functionally decomposed solutions. I'm going to okay. So for our lab, some of on Wednesday, some of them on Monday today, you're going to be asked to do something very similar to this. Let's take this apart so that nobody has any problems with understanding what's going on. We've all used string and user namespace, but F -string is a li F stream is a library that you'll need in order to be able to define your input and output data files. And you'll need to give them names. Now, one thing about an output file is the second you write out to an output file that's open, if it doesn't exist, it'll create one for you. But if it does exist, it'll write over the old. So be careful with the names you give these. It might write over something that you need inadvertently. So every time you recompile and you execute your program with an output file, it'll ask you, well, if one exists, do you want me to change it or write over it? So it gives you like a little warning when it executes. <coughs> so we'll be doing something very similar to this, and that's the structure with that like. And also yeah. notice the liberation of comments on all of my code I'm showing. Going to start to stress that more and more that you comment your code. So here we have an example, and where we use C out as our output <laughs> object. When we're dealing with files, we deal with the file object name that we have defined on our declaration statement. The declaration statement here, this is the type. It's an F st IF stream object, input file object. It's called end data. It's an output file object. 
to call out things. Those are declarations just like int x or float y. These are declarations of variable names and types. So that variable name is used with the insertion operator to output information out to our output file. And we use endl on our output statement. Can endl be used on an input statement? No. Myself, your students making that mistake. This ma manipulator is only for output. And it simply moves the cursor or the output marker to the next line on our output string. And similarly, on our <coughs> input data object, we can apply the extraction operator to read information from our file. And you can imagine that here, these values in our file are separated by spaces or by end of line characters because that operator skips over both of those, considering them both white space. So uh, it would probably be a file here that could look any it could look like this one. <coughs> the data could be written like that with a return after each of these, or it could be written like this. Space, space, space. So this way would satisfy the format for reading in that manner. And alternatively, that format for the input file could also be the proper format necessary to respond to that input. So that having been established, output statement to our output file would put all of that information on a single line and follow it up with just simple reversal or a different format for the output data. But this endl, it, it all comes on the next line. So that statement would come on one line, that statement would come on one line, that statement would come on one line. My file is quite a bit longer. Yes? Well, in older operating systems, not XP, not Vista, but in older operating systems, if you didn't close your file and you came back again to read it, it would be in an open state and some very strange things would happen. But in our modern operating systems, when that EXE file stops, that termination occurs, it automatically closes all the files for you. So it's more or less a remnant from older operating systems. But it's always a good thing to do. And you're going to find, and it's going to be something we'll use, you can input data from a file to an output file, like this does. And then you can close that output file and open it as for input. In other words, you've written to it in your program, and now you want to close it for output, and then reopen the same file for input so you can read out of it. Okay? Let's think about why that might be useful. Why that might be useful. Right, suppose you want to type it all in. You've got it all in once, you save it in a file, it's output to that file, now you want to read it into the next function to do something with it, you've got it stored. And the other reason is that you now have it stored for use tomorrow, the next day, later on the file. Okay. Also, if you've got a lot of data, a lot of data being generated by your program, and that console window, console window is not big enough to hold it, one of the things that we're going to do in assignment six is we're going to develop a calendar. Calendar has, you know, 12 months, each month has five weeks or more. 
different heading and so forth and so on. And to output that to the console window and to copy and paste it into the end of your program can be a little bit cumbersome. Okay? And it's going to scroll past pretty quickly, so you might not even be able to see January. You won't be able to see January by the time it's finished and see whether it works. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to take that calendar, put it to an output file, and instead of appending the contents of your console window as output from your program, I'm going to ask you to go into that file and copy and paste the contents of that file as a comment at the end of your code. All this should not be any way foreign to you. We've been, we've been talking this for three or four weeks now. So if you understand what we're doing with that console window, it's copying and pasting your output and putting it as a comment, you're going to understand that there's just not a lot of space in all this stuff. So you're outputting major pieces of data, major lines of information coming out of your program. You need an output file to hold it, something other than C out. Okay, it is approaching 